Uh, so 50 years ago is a very short amount of time in the grand scheme of things. But in all of your lifetimes, and certainly mine, it's a big chunk of time. Probably most of you weren't even born 50 years ago. But 51 years ago, think about it, we were landing on the moon in June 1969. And think you've all seen that iconic picture of the, the Earth rise as taken from the moon and how that one image just shattered our whole conception of ourselves and our place in the universe. And it also allowed us to see that incredible, exquisite, blue, gorgeous planet. I think that started to change the way we thought about everything. Now, 50 years ago, we had the first Earth Day, April 22nd, 1970. And here we are today, 50 years later, in the midst of a global pandemic of coronavirus, COVID-19. This virus, as tragic and as epic and as horrific as it's all been, presents us also with an important window of opportunity to learn about what's happening with our society, what we've been doing wrong, how we can change things. Fifty years later, it shouldn't surprise us that our failure to act on the things that we had agreed on in April 1970, that failure has brought our society to its knees. Now this pandemic is our window of opportunity to step back from the normal rush and tumble of our society and ask ourselves, what kind of society do we really want to have? And how are we going to get there? Who would have thought that our lives would have been turned upside down quite so fast? Well, of course, I can tell you who. <laughs> it's been the scientists that have been warning us for years, for decades, really, of global pandemics, of climate change, of species extinctions, of social unrest, of water insecurity, of pollution, of human health and the toxins in our bodies. So why haven't we been listening? What is it that we can do with this time that we've been granted by fate, <laughs> whatever you may wish to call it, to ask ourselves, what is it about business as usual? What is it about normal, see, that we wish to rush back to? And what things might we better just let go? I'm Phoebe Barnard, and I've been working on climate change and biodiversity and the state of the earth <laughs> since I was a teenager. I'm the chief science and policy officer at the Conservation Biology Institute, and I'm an affiliate full professor at the University of Washington. Also, having lived in Africa for a long time, I'm research associate at the University of Cape Town. And these wonderful experiences that I have when I went to Africa as a young married woman for three years, <laughs> turned into 34 years, have taught me a whole range of things about how powerful it is to have an opportunity to ask the simple question, what kind of a society do we actually want? Now, when I moved to southern Africa, Namibia was on the verge of its independence in 1990. And South Africa, four years later, was going to undergo its democratic transition from the apartheid era to its modern, modern democratic world. And both of those countries had that moment in time where they could ask themselves, what are we doing here? How do we want to change from our colonial past? When I moved back to my own country three years ago in 2017, I thought this country is such a juggernaut. It's such a Titanic that it will be hard for us ever to get to the point where we ask ourselves those questions. And yet here we are. So what can we do with this incredible teaching and learning moment that we've been granted by this global pandemic and all the self-isolation and enforced quarantine that we are all facing around the world to learn 
from our mistakes as a society. I was lucky enough to grow up in an American family where people and the planet actually mattered and kindness and justice and service to the community. Not profit, not ego, <laughs> not ambition, not status, just those gentle things of compassion and environmental health and nature and goodness. When I went off to live in Africa, I was very lucky to be in the right place at the right time where I could be brought into teams that were setting up big programs that would give effect to the constitution of Namibia, for example. So running national programs, setting up and running national programs there, um, gave me an incredible insight into the, the power of working collaboratively, bringing teams of people together that had never <laughs> worked together in the past, and sometimes were very distrustful of each other, and how with the right kind of incentives and the right kind of team building, you could get people working together to change, to transform society. We have a lot of talent here in Washington State, though, as in the rest of the world. And like many of us, I've been wondering why with all of this talent, with all of this leadership potential, <laughs> we have leaders, some of whom are so abysmal. We now live in Skagit County, one of the most beautiful places in the world. And I look around and I think, what an extraordinary window of opportunity we have here. In Skagit, we have beautiful landscapes, lots of arable land, fertile soils, good water security, excellent governance, and pretty well-educated and, and kind communities who look after each other. And those are our greatest strengths right now. They're also the reason why a lot of people are going to want to move here over the period of climate change as life becomes increasingly hostile and untenable and inhospitable for people living elsewhere in the world. We know in Skagit County that we're already seeing changes in agriculture, in wild species, in forest health. Some of the work that we're doing in Anacortes with the Anacortes Community Forest Lands and Transition Fidelgo and the City of Anacortes as a collaborative project with a number of organizations, the Skagit Land Trust and others, that we have the opportunity to say, this is what's happening with our forests. These are the changes that are coming. We might be able to do something about that, but not if we're not looking, not if we're not paying attention. We have to be sitting with our eyes wide open and our ears open, watching the horizon in order to make changes that will allow us to adapt to the new normal. It would be a mistake to assume that this window of opportunity with good governance and good communities will be open forever. So as I always say, the world doesn't have to be this way. <laughs> we can change it. We are changing it. Become involved you will find yourself so much more empowered, so much healthier, so much more energized to be part of the solution rather than anxious about the scale of the problem. There's so much going on here. Our local transition movements, our YMCAs, our community uh, support groups. Find a way to get involved and be part of the solution. We've been planting a victory garden in our house, where we've got collard greens, Brussels sprouts, cabbage, <laughs> um, broccoli, cauliflower, um, ginger, blueberries, fruit trees, nut trees. And all of these things help us plan for resilience if supply chains are disrupted. The transition movement has been working on helping communities become more resilient to climate change and other shocks to the system. And now we are living these moments. Let's learn from these groups that are helping our, our societies transform into the future. Another thing that we do in our family is 
uh, keep our immune system health up. <laughs> we have ginger, fresh ginger and lemon tea every day. Uh, I drink pond water, <laughs> what I call pond water, not literally pond water, from our probiotic factory on our kitchen counter where we take healthy gut bacteria and grow them to sip every day to make sure that our gut, which is the seat of our immune system, remains healthy and able to uh, help us resist coronavirus and other infections. Finally, remember what we've all been taught when we've sat on planes. If there's a problem, put your own face mask on first. Put your own oxygen mask on first. In these times of greater uncertainty, greater anxiety, the most important thing that we can all do is to look after ourselves and our capacity to be resilient for those around us. To get enough sleep, to eat well, raw healthy food as much as possible, preferably food that's locally grown, avoiding sugar and all that. Making sure that we breathe deeply every day and we appreciate the things that work well for us. Appreciate those of us who have a roof over our heads, that we have that, that we have family and friends, even if we can't hug them right now, that we can stay in touch with them. Sleep, good food, plenty of water, deep breathing, exercise, whether it's yoga or sprinting or pole vaulting, do what you do best, keep your strength. All of these things help empower us to be fully effective and present and there for these times.